wild weekend in college basketball. I want to talk before we get into kind of the the first month superlatives from this past season. I think we have to talk about some of the games from this weekend. Um, Indiana lost to Arizona in a game where Arizona looked about as impressive as I think you can look. Uh, Maryland lost to to Tennessee in a game that looked about as uh, unimpressive on the offensive end as either team could possibly look. Both of those teams badly needed a a guy that could shoot it um, like John Fanta. And I, but I think the biggest story from that weekend was Alabama down by 15 on the road at Houston, best defensive team in college basketball, toughest team in college basketball, uh, uh, 7,000 people in the Fertitta Center, and they outscored Houston 42 to 21 with four freshmen on the floor for the final 15 minutes of that game in what I would argue will probably end up being as impressive, if not the most impressive yes. win from any team that we see throughout this college basketball season. T.O., I am going to you first on this one. You don't want to talk about uh, domestic violence, but I think that we can talk about the the way that two teams play in the state of Texas. So, T.O. Solid transition. Very good transition. I'm going to you first on this one, my man. What do you make of of Alabama? What do you make of the SEC? What do you make of Nate Oates Ball Club? They're pretty good. Uh, Very uh, deep. You look at who played the best off that team. Noah Clowney was a dude. And that's another freshman. Everybody's mm-hmm. talking about Brandon Miller. And Brandon Miller is as good as advertised. And they did a nice job of shutting him down. He only ended up with eight points on O of eight shooting. Eight points on O of eight shooting against the toughest team in the country. And they just kept throwing bodies at you, did Alabama. That What an impressive – another impressive win. They've had some – they've won ugly. They've won pretty – like Alabama and Nate Oates, that, that team's as good as advertised. And we put them in the top four. I think that was a consensus feel for all three of us uh, of the SEC. Like, they could very well win it, too. That Noah Clowney, he's from Spartanburg. He's about from 45 minutes away from where I'm from. And he was the least heralded recruit out of that entire lot. And he ends up with 16 and 11. So, like... There's just so many different guys for this Alabama team. And you're able to go down. Is it for Tita or for Tita? Whatever it is, the, I it, think it's for Tita. There's got to be an L. There's got to be an fan. L in there somewhere now, T.O. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the for Tita, but like, <laughs> but like that is a solid play. That is a tough place to play, and they went in there against the toughest team in the country and came out with a win after last year. And you remember that whole situation where Alabama won, mm-hmm. and like the the was it a gold ten? Was it a not a was it not a gold ten? It was a gold ten. Just loaded again, and it's a guy that nobody really talked about heading into the season. Noah Clowney, Dorman High School's finest, or at least out of that freshman class last year. I mean, really impressive performance. Yeah, Fanta, I want to know how you didn't react to To saying I like the Fertitta. I, I like your pronunciation. Level, <laughs> I tried to keep a level face on that one uh, because To said enough to both of us that. That, that one's not surprising, right? That one's not as surprising. You guys should hear what he says off the record. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. It's as impressive of a win that we've seen this season in college basketball, and it has unlimited mileage, literal unlimited mileage. You tweeted it on Saturday and summed it up so well for Alabama to be down, what, in the second half? 17 15. points? It was 44-29 with 17 minutes left. They outscored him 42-21. to Incredible, incredible sequence of events. And for Alabama offensively to do that, to do that against any top 25 team would be pretty impressive. They did it against the toughest team in the country. Mm -hmm. That is super impressive. And it goes to show you this. That Nate Oates is one of the best program builders in America. He's done a remarkable job with Alabama. He has elevated that program so well since he took over. Remember, he took over for Avery Johnson. He took over for Avery Johnson during a time where Alabama, frankly, guys, had no relevance in men's basketball. And you knew when they hired Oates, that was a praise hire. And for good reason. Noah Clowney is big time. I yeah, mean, he, is. He, he he is a tough you-know-what. And I thought he rose to the occasion time and again in this game to go for 16 and 11 
against Houston's front court is really impressive. You know, he he gives Alabama, if you think Alabama is soft or if you thought, oh, they're just a they're just they just did it with offense. No. To beat Houston, you've got to have a toughness factor. And they out rebounded Houston 44 to 39 in this game. But you know, when I when I look at it, guys, here's the thing with Alabama. They only had nine assists in this game. They only had nine assists in this game. And what I mean by that is it's really hard to flow against Houston. Like, yeah. it's really hard to be fluid in your offense as a team. It's That's hard such to a play. great point. You know what beats Houston? Not team play. At a certain level, to beat them, you've got to have some individual playmaking. And, and that's not a slight on Alabama as a team. They got a really good team. But to beat Houston, you've got to have some individuals step up. That's what happened in this game. Yeah, there, there was a toughness level there. The last point I want to make on Indiana, and then we can, uh, Indiana, Alabama, and then we can kind of move on from there. Um, Javon Quinterly didn't play a second in the second half, not one second. And he, if you go back and you watch, like he's not complaining about it, he's not whining about it, he's not moping, he's not sulking on the sideline. He's the guy that's there clapping everyone on, being like, Coach, leave Jaden in there. He's kicking their ass, right? Leave Jaden in there. He's the guy that's winning this battle right now. Um, and I think that that is, one, a very different mindset than we saw from last year's Alabama team, right? I think that there was a little bit more I need to get mine on last year's Alabama team. And that's exactly what we saw out of the group. Like, Nate Oates, has, for two years, every time I've talked with him about his group, has raved about uh, Herb Jones and his ability to kind of um, put the team in front of himself, to care more about this is going to be the most cliche shit you ever heard, but the name on the front of the jersey as opposed to the name on the back of the jersey, right? And I think that's what we have out of this group this year. All those guys care about winning and care about Alabama and understand that if that happens and if good things happen to the program, good things are going to happen to them individually. So that, I that think that also happens when there's a clear, when somebody clearly won a battle. Well, no, but here's the thing like Javon Quinterly, uh, he's not. I don't want to slander the kid, right? Like, I'm not trying to come at him, but he's not the kind of guy that coming into this season, I would have sat there and said, I bet he's going to be okay playing 13 minutes and letting a freshman go in there and star on the road against the number one team. And he is like credit to him, right? The fact that he actually was, was able to kind of let that happen and let it happen around him is, I think is a very good thing. And it's, um, when you have buy-in like that from your group, I think that's really important. Uh, just one note on Houston, uh, Marcus Sasser really has not looked right at all this season. He's averaging, I think he's averaging 16 points, but he has not looked like the guy that we all thought was going to be the first team all American best guard in college basketball. I know that he's still dealing with like a shoulder thing, um, there were questions about whether or not he was going to play in this game. So I'm not worried about Houston at all. They are who they are and they do what they do. And I think this game might've been a little bit different if Tremon Mark did not get a horrible fifth foul call on a, on a flop from, uh, I think it was, uh, I think it was your boy Clowney that actually flopped to you. So not shocked. yeah, credit not to him shocked. on, on yeah, those South Carolina guys. Right? Hey man, we tried so hard to get Clowney to play with Julian Phillips on AAU. <laughs> Oh, that's, that a nuts, that's a perfect. But he ended up going down. He ended up playing for the Celtics. Yeah, that's point. a perfect transition. Let's talk about your boy Julian Phillips because Tennessee was up by as many as 18 points against Maryland on Sunday afternoon at the Barclays Center. Almost gave it all the way back. Uh, uh, Maryland had a couple shots to tie the game late down the stretch. Final was 56 to 53. To that was a hideous basketball game that set the sport <laughs> back at least two decades. Hey, Tennessee's Maryland. good for one a year. They're good for one a year like that. Yes. Just one. Stop, stop bringing them to New York City. Just yeah, they're in New York. Oh, yeah, 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 New yeah. York's a bad spot. Rick. New York's yeah. a bad spot. No, no more time. games in New York. You're Last right. time they were in New York, they, they went to overtime with Texas Tech and won a game in the 40s. It was 37-37 yeah. headed into double overtime. Like, what are we doing? We Tennessee. were waiting for Villanova Rick. Syracuse. Remember the chorus of booze? Yep. Oh, yeah. They Rick. went to overtime and everybody booed them. Stay, stay in, in Knoxville. Manhattan. Stay in the South. You score in the South. You come to New York, you don't score. Stay, <laughs> stay down south. Of the Ma stay south of the Mason Dixon, yes. Rocky Top. Uh, no, it's a good win, man. Tough team. They guard. They guard. Yeah, they ball. guard. Both teams guard. And, and Tennessee took off defensively. They were causing all sorts of turnovers, holding Maryland, I want to say, in the teens from the field. And then in the second half, Kevin Willard figured them out. That's what happened, guys. Like, in, in the second half, Kevin Willard figured them out. They started running that Spain pick and roll. Like, that. the, the, the uh, 
Is that what you call it? What do you call it, T.O.? When you set the the back screen for the the roll man, yeah, I call it Spain pick and roll. They got yeah, that about what, five yeah, straight possessions down the stretch. That's the nomenclature, I guess. But yeah, Spain pick and roll, and then you get some guys out on an island, and you get that five man stuck. So what ends up happening? You get some mismatches. But I digress. This happened to be this was more kind of an indictment on Tennessee's here today gone tomorrow offense. Like that's a that's a scary thing, guys. When Tennessee's playing well offensively and they're turning offense into defense and turning people over, like they can beat anybody. It's when this game slows down to a crawl. How are they going to find shots? That's concerning. Now, I, I did, I did, and still do think that Julian Phillips changes things for them because typically he's a guy that can get to the free throw line. He's a guy that can make some tough shots when you need to and give them another element. But Julian was one for 10 from two. Like, that's got to be better. And I hate saying that because he's my man. But, like, you at the same time, like, you have to have somebody able to create something whenever you're dealing uh, with a team like Maryland at the end of the game that's really sitting down and guarding. Mm -hmm. Fanta? Well, I think that this was an example of the concerns surrounding Tennessee offensively. And – an example of why the volunteers have failed to have the major mark March breakthrough under Rick Barnes. And I know that it's a game in December. I know a lot of people might say, well, how, how could you conclude that? Because this has come up before with the vowels where they go through offensive droughts. And I just look at them. They're hard to trust guys. They're hard to trust at times. Because I think they play very, very hard. I think that they're a together group. But in this game, Santiago Vescovi goes two for 11 from the field. Two for 11 from the field. Key goes two for six in this one. And Ziegler goes five for 13. And the point that I'm trying to make is, is that as good as that backcourt can be when they're meshing, which we've talked about, T.O., we've talked about that backcourt, what it can be when they're at their best, what it was in the preseason, which now, guys, I really, I kind of think differently about their commanding win over Gonzaga in the in the preseason. Like, now seeing some of the results, it doesn't come all that shocking mm -hmm. the way they won that game. Mm -hmm. But they're just not a great shooting team. They're not. They're not a great mm -hmm. shooting team. And, and Phillips won for 10 in this game. You almost look at some of the numbers. You're like, how did they win this game? Well, it's because they, they guard, the man. They guard. Like, they, well, the defense travels. Yeah, like, even when they – they but, won but, the Texas Tech game last year, right? right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did. Okay. The defense, like, the defense travels. A lot of teams' defense travels. It, yeah. But to win, big picture, to win in March, your offense has to travel. Your offense has to travel. You can't just be a great defensive team, Okay. Ask Tony Bennett how that worked out for him one year. And then the next year, they, you know what? One Virginia national championship, individual plays. Yep. Individual plays. Ty Jerome, Kyle Guy make an individual plays. Tennessee's At, when, got some play. you think about it, that Virginia run some... was, the, was the luckiest run in the history of, of national title winners, man. They were down 14 in the first half to uh was it liberty who who they playing whoever was that the was first when they, yeah everybody they were kind of getting over the jitters yeah it was gardner webb they were down 14 in the first half to gardner webb um they smacked whoever they played in the second round but in the sweet 16 it was i want to say it was oregon and they were down six with like uh with like four minutes left in that game in the elite eight they probably should have lost to uh to purdue i believe it was in the final four they needed kyle guy to get fouled and make three free throws um in the, with like 1.6 seconds left on the clock. And then they needed a game time three from Deion. They, they could have lost every single one of those games. They could have lost all four of their last games uh, in that, that tournament run. Sorry, not to cut you off, Fanta, but that was – if if you put Virginia losing to number 16 seed, UMBC in 2018, and then went to that run in 2019 to the national title and made that a movie, I'd be like, that shit, come on, man. Come on, that's Hollywood building up what an actual – NCAA tournament run looks like. Sorry, I got sorry. But it also, but the defense also gives you a baseline. That, that but to kind of get back to <laughs> get get back to Tennessee and to incorporate what you said about it gives you a baseline. So like, if you're able to build it up big enough of a, 
difference. They're just so big and so physical. Like they're going to be able they to win. Are. They, they are. They are. It's be able not to win ugly. You're going to be able to win ugly some games. And, mm -hmm. you know, the biggest thing is, is who's their guard that can, like, yeah. best can be. Yeah. They just. How are they different? That's my point. That's like, the thing. That's what I meant. That's what I was hoping that. I, and I still think Julian Phillips could be that guy, but they have to have, they they have to have more production out of him. And guys, let's keep in mind, like we can overreact all we want. They won, they still won, and it's you, you got to find a way to squeak one out ugly sometimes. And they did it. So they got I, Arizona Saturday. That's going to be a battle. Gosh, big, big bodies against big bodies. What a great matchup. Ooh, it's right. good. Let's talk Where's about Arizona. I think it's at Arizona. Oh, it is because it's the return of the of the game last year. That was a great. Yeah. Yes. Let's, let's talk it's about Arizona. In Tucson. Big, biggest game at biggest game out in Tucson in what feels like a little bit. I mean that like UCLA last year. That's McHale Center. Awesome mm -hmm. environment. That'll be fun Saturday night. Yeah. Let's talk about Arizona because they picked up a. Uh, a pretty 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 impressive win over Indiana. Indiana made a run of the second half, but for the most part, um Arizona was in control for the majority of that game. What do you uh, Phantom, what do you make of this Arizona team? I talked about them quite a bit on Saturday night after the game. I think that they are uh they are incredible offensively and it's baffling to me how a team that plays two big men, neither of whom can have even attempt to shoot threes can be this good on the offensive end of the floor. It's it's really something to watch. Saturday night was the difference between a Sweet 16 team and a Final Four team. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. I think Indiana's a good team. I think Arizona's a great team. And you've got to give Tommy Lloyd immense credit for what he's been able to do with two post players. Right. The duo of Azulis Tabellis and Omar Ballo have been – sensational together gentlemen they play off each other they run the floor they make things happen and it has basically become automatic robin terrence that tabellus and ballo are combining for close to 40 points per game and close to 20 rebounds per game this isn't a one-off it's happening pretty much game in and game out and there's a structure to that i think that tommy lloyd Last year, the narrative was, well, he inherited great talent. And there's mm -hmm. no question that he did. But he's gotten the most out of it in the process, in the way that they're playing. And honestly, when we were talking about the year of the big in college basketball in the preseason, we weren't necessarily focusing on Arizona. They weren't one of the focal points of this discussion. They're the embodiment of year of the big <laughs> they really are. other program in the country right now. And headband Kerr. Don't forget of about course. headband Kerr. Of course, who has evolved, guys. You got to give really Kerr Creason. He has evolved as a player. The things we knocked him on last year, he addressed. Hats off to you, Kerr Creason, because you developed in college basketball. And as a result, the Wildcats, the Wildcats can win it all. They can. And, and well, keep in mind, Kerr had six turnovers. So, but he had seven assists. He's knocking down shots. The better, the, the, yeah, better, better. Right. But he's not as emotionally crazy as he was last year. I think that's a, that, that's obviously a point of emphasis for him. Like he's really reined it in. And I say that like tongue in cheek because I love a guy that's fired up and fiery and wants to compete. But if you're the point guard on a team, it reminds you of someone. Yeah. Yeah. See, I love that stuff. Like I like it when a guy's passionate. And then this really brings the energy every game. But like, if you look at their team, like my biggest concern about Arizona was their depth. And yet Adama Ball comes in, plays 13 minutes, not bangs in three threes. Uh, Henry Vasier, like he, he comes in and gives good minutes. Like Cedric Henderson is, is a nice player for them. I worry about their depth a little bit, but those two bigs, man, like there's such, there's such a counter to everything that everybody's doing right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, this. so you're a curveball, And if those guys are able to guard out on the perimeter, like they're, they're really tough to match up with on the other end because they're so big physical and play hard now. And then and you, the, just a real quick point on that. They don't have to be great defensively either because Arizona is just so good on the offensive end of the floor. Like you have to run with them. 
they're going to put up 80, 85, 90 points on you, right? So you yeah. have to be able to score with them. You, you don't have to be great defensively if you're Arizona. Best um, and offensive I do, team in the country. It, it's easy when you shoot 61% from the field. Yeah, and I, the reason why I think it works is twofold. One, um, they they move so much offensively that it's very difficult to kind of be in position to to be in position when it comes to being help side or weak side or getting those double teams in. And the other part of it is uh, both Ballo and Tubelis are great high low passers, great entry feed passers, and specifically Tubelis like that dude's got the quickest release of any post player I've ever seen. Like we talk about I think I've mentioned this before, um but we talk about quick releases when it comes to three point shooters a lot. Like that dude catches it and it's up. Yep. Catches you know it and it's great. You know what's crazy is they're playing two bigs and they're still fourth in the country in adjusted tempo. They're playing two bigs and they're still that fast. Like, and it, everybody's top wants these stretch fours and versatile floor spacers and all this stuff. And Arizona's just doing it their way. And you're going to have to go back and and basically re- rewrite your game plan to how you're going to guard them. Mm-hmm. And it just makes it hard because you want to be fast because they're still playing fast. So defensively, it's like, damn if you do, damn if you don't. Like, what do you do? Like, Arizona's legitimate national title contenders. And when you're, dude, they're shooting 63.5% from two. Yeah, think That's about it. They're legitimate national stupid. title contenders. They lost Ben Mather and they lost Dale and Terry a year earlier than anyone thought they were going to lose them. And they lost Christian Coloco. And it doesn't matter. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Look, to, to hash on there on uh, Indiana real quick, uh, the fact that Trace Jackson Davis, like, this is what everybody's concern is with Indiana. Right, because like he's four for ten from two, and he ends up fouling out against really big dudes. So mm-hmm. like, ideally, what would you like him to do against those guys? Be able to hit a jump shot, cool. and it just hasn't. It just has never really come. Now he's been wildly effective for the most of his career, and he's an All American because of it. But this is kind of the hang up of like, why hasn't he been able to go earlier? But. Indiana, I think you were you hit it right on the head, Fanta, Sweet 16 team. I, I think they're there. Yep. And that's good. That's very good. 